and Vince would have liked to have seen a lot of organizations, including us, not exist. How we existed as long as we wished to, and that needs to be remembered. He didn't kick our asses out. We didn't dissolve to nothing. We did it as long as we desired to do it. Welcome back to Dark Side of the Ring Unheard, the podcast from the hit Vice TV series Dark Side of the Ring, where we plunge into the Dark Side archives to uncover real revelations from some of pro wrestling's most storied characters, which until now have never been broadcast. I'm Jack Encarnacio from the Lapsed Fan Wrestling Podcast, joined by my Lapsed Fan co-host JP Sorrow, as well as Dark Side of the Ring's executive producer and co-creator of the show, Evan Husney, don't forget, Dark Side of the Ring coming at you with a brand new episode, and we'll talk about who to expect on the television show uh, on Tuesday. And it ties in with our guest today because we're talking about the one and only Terry Funk, who is considered one of, if not the greatest professional wrestler of all time, certainly one of its most varied and influential performers. And we get such a great glimpse at this true link to a bygone era in this dark side archival sound that we're going to bring to you this week. Dark side cameras were able to get us sitting in with the Funker as he was affectionately known in the industry in his famed hometown of Amarillo, Texas to talk about one of his seem, you know, it seems like dozens of legendary pupils. Uh, this one was Japanese deathmatch specialist and indie Japanese wrestling iconoclast at Shushi Onita for an episode last season on dark side about Onita and his promotion, Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling, or FMW, which Terry Funk actually lent instant credibility to in embarking on a really insane, hyper-violent, spectacle-laden chapter of his long wrestling career. And Evan, we're talking about Terry Funk ahead of next week's premiere episode on one of Terry Funk's most famed contemporaries, the very man, in fact, that he dropped the world's heavyweight wrestling title to in 1977 in Toronto, thus setting this gentleman on a path to be goaded in his own right in the business, Harley Race. So first, let's talk a bit about what to expect on the next Dark Side, if we could, Evan, with Harley Race, and we're really going to get to know the era that he belonged to in in this Terry Funk episode this week. Oh, man, we are talking about uh, two of my favorites uh, of all time in both Terry Funk and Harley Race, but that's right, next week, of course, uh, next Tuesday on Dark Side of the Ring for Season 5, continuing with the Harley Race episode, and uh, this this was uh, an amazing journey making this. Uh, you know, we're huge fans, and you might not be able to necessarily point to a specific, you know, uh, in, uh, inciting dark, if you will, um, controversial event, you know, with Harley that might make you think, oh, of course, a Dark Side of the Ring episode. No, you know, from time to time, we do like to profile uh, the careers of you know, uh, mythical figures such as Harley. And, you know, he's lived a very hard, or he lived a very hard uh, and tough, hard knock life, uh, compromised of, you know, a lot of tragedy, violence, um, and, and a wealth of tall tales and insane stories that definitely, you know, will be enough uh, and obviously can extend beyond the runtime of a show of Dark Side. But um, it was an amazing experience to spotlight uh, the history of Harley. Um, definitely hard to, to, to capture in just 44 minutes, but the episode definitely takes you on a wild ride uh, through all of those instances. And it's really remarkable. I would say the thing that um, I'm most excited about for people to see, and I'll tease it right here, is this was some of the greatest unseen archive of Harley Race, like some of the best archival materials we've ever, you know, photos, videos, film. There was actually a lot of Super 8 and 16 millimeter stuff we had scanned uh, for this episode. So it's a treasure trove of unseen Harley archive. Uh, And one, my favorite thing that you're going to see next week is uh, never before seen eight millimeter footage of a party at Harley Race's house uh, that, uh, you know, some kind of, you know, dancing, you know, cocktails and dance party at his house uh, with the guests being Terry Funk, Dory, Sr. and Jr. Uh, 
all sort of, uh, I you think know, can you smell the KC ribs, <laughs> right? Smoking right now. Yeah. And, uh, I think this is from 1968. So it is 1968 house party footage. Unbelievable. And also I should say, I think, and some other historians might have to confirm this, but as far as our resources can tell, it is some of the Uh, We also have some footage of him from Japan from, I think, 1968 of Harley wrestling. And I believe it might be the earliest known footage of him wrestling. Uh, That's never been seen before. So um, so that's the most exciting part of the episode is this treasure trove of archive that we have. Um, And yeah, uh, you know, his story. I don't I don't want to get into I don't want to spoil it or anything. But I mean, you know, he he lived a life. (laughs) Let's just put it that way. So looking forward to that. And in a lot of ways, you know, some of the real accelerants to Harley Race's career was his association with the Funks. He, he went to work for Terry's father. You mentioned Dory Sr.'s promotion out of Amarillo, Texas, which for a smaller city in the Texas panhandle was one of the most influential areas across the entire wrestling world. You had the Funks being the sort of U.S. emissaries and talent bookers for Giant Baba, who ran one of the two biggest Japanese wrestling organizations in all Japan pro wrestling. So all the guys that they recruited into the business went on to get great paydays in Japan because of that. And further, Harley Race got his start, you know, sort of putting matches together and, and being more than just a wrestler for the Amarillo office in, in the very early 70s and credits Terry Funk for so much of the success that he had in his career. As I mentioned, when it came time for Terry to drop the mantle as the top wrestler in the industry in the 70s, the mid 70s as world champion of the National Wrestling Alliance, it was Harley Race that Terry Funk handpicked to transition the title to. Um you were able to sit with Terry, Evan, as part of the episode on Etchushi Onida. And like we like to do here on Unheard, we we realize that in the archives that while you sat with Terry to talk about someone other than himself, of course, you, you have to get into a bit of how, how did you become Terry Funk? Where did you come from? And a lot of the sound we're going to share today, and I'm sure you recall sitting in, in his environs there as he was really close to death death's door, ultimately, and sadly, um, you, get a, you get a glimpse at a time in wrestling that's just pretty much lost to memory. Yeah. And it was, it was a truly, um, you know, absolutely amazing experience. Uh, mainly because as I mentioned, you know, Terry Funk is my favorite wrestler of all time. So this was a huge opportunity to, to mark out as they say. Um, I, I've been a fan of Terry's for you know, for as long as I've really been a, like a real wrestling fan, you know, uh, obviously his work in ECW, <laughs> it's amazing. It's incredible. Yeah, uh, yeah. Watching him in Beyond the Mat. We've talked about that on this program before. Um, you know, he's a big standout character in that. And that was a, that that film made a huge impression on me. Um, and of course, WWF, you know, in the, in the late 90s, Chainsaw Charlie, you know, is right in my demographic of where I came in. And of course, learning all obviously about his history and, you know, his uh, his own territory and his father and his brother and their NWA runs, but also their Japanese careers, too. Um, are just uh, phenomenal. Some in, just incredible stuff. The stuff with you know Bruiser Brody and um, so on and so forth. Uh, so I've always been a huge fan. And this was back in season three days. And season three was such a wild and unique experience in and of itself uh, to produce because it was right during the pandemic. Like it was August and September of 2020 when we're doing all this filming, and you know it was such a different world. <laughs> And uh, at the time, we thought it was a good idea to, instead of flying all around to these different towns and doing the interviews and everything, we thought it would make more sense to do it uh, via RV. So we actually drove cross country multiple times in order to film. The you did show. like uh, Terry's family did when his father was a, a traveling wrestler, as we'll get to in the oh, in yeah. the fifties. That's that lifestyle in the RV. It was. And it was it was like, you know, being on the road, you know, I mean, it was being on the road, but like, you know, living that wrestler lifestyle. And um, it was it was crazy. It was why we were just sleeping at campsites and it was there was a lot of grind and just it was wild. But it was an amazing experience. And I remember when we finally got to Amarillo and got to his home and, you know, he had a lot of amazing um memorabilia photographs like he he had like i think the letter that or the telegram that came in it, like uh that was uh, um that had um informed him that he was going to be winning the NWA World Heavyweight Champion like it's all these amazing historical things in his house and of course he was so nice so friendly you know uh, in his final years he was you know battling dementia or alzheimer's i can't remember exactly um but uh, so that was definitely apparent uh in 
you know, us sort of, uh, you know, working with him, but. And going over the transcript, I noticed at one point, he even says, if you see me shaking a lot, that's the Parkinson's. So he had that issue as well. He did. Yeah. He seemed like, and, and I think it was only months after this that he would, uh, that he was put in an, like, like in a care facility. Um, this was sort of right at the end of him living at home, uh, and his daughters were taking care of him. They were super nice and amazing. And I, I think we literally came in at the exact right moment to capture this interview, um, uh, where where maybe if it would have been a few months later, it wouldn't have been possible. So I feel very fortunate we had that experience. It was amazing. Again, he was super nice um, and super generous with his time. And uh, I loved hearing about FMW. Just real quick shout out <laughs> to that, because that's, of course, what we interviewed Terry for was the FMW um um, um, at Sushi Onita episode. And, ah, man, again, right during the pandemic, that's what I was watching. Everybody else was watching the Sopranos. I was watching, uh, (laughs) rewatching all of FMW. People exploding in the ring and (laughs) barbed wire and bombs and glass and death. Yes. It's so true. I was watching the Sopranos with my wife. There you go. <laughs> <That's very laughs> Both sides of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, literally it, it was, I had never, I'd always wanted to do it because I was kind of like, oh yeah, this is, cause I, I actually remember FMW, uh, way back in the early nineties, like, or, or sorry, the mid ninety, mid to late nineties, you would be on the internet and you'd see these like exploding ring gifts, these very low res gifts of what that exploding ring, the match with, you know, Terry Funk and Onita. And it was just like, what is this? Is this real? You know? And, um, it was something I'd always seen clips from. And of course that, 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 that Sheik and Sabu match where the rings on fire and like everyone should have died in the whole building, you know, from that. And, uh, it just always captured my imagination. This idea of like having matches where wrestlers are taking little boats out to a ring. That's like in the middle of a body of water. It just captured my imagination. And, uh, it is amazing too. When you go back and you watch FMW and you see all the emotion behind it, you see this guy, you know, you see Terry Funk and you see Onita, um, the way they would perform and how dramatic it would get, like at the end of a match, they're arm in arm, you know, crying and the audience is cheering them on, you know, dumping them with buckets of water while like, you know, moody Japanese guitar solos are, you know, underscoring all of this. Yes, it's just, yes. it's like, man, like modern wrestling needs to take, uh, they need to take a look at this stuff. Well, AEW tried Yeah, to. there have been attempts that <laughs> would create attempts. this. But like, look at the production value of all this. Look at the mood that's in the lighting that they use for their matches and just the way everything looks. It's it's one. It's my favorite presentation of wrestling from a production standpoint is FMW. And um, yeah, so it was an honor to do the episode because I was way into it at the time. And then just the icing on the cake was being able to sit down with Terry Funk and, 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 and talk to him about, you know, anything and everything. And it was amazing. To zoom out a bit, JP, we know a little something about Terry Funk over at the Lapsed Fan Podcast. Yes, we do. We just completed a several a month, bit. um, just journey through his entire career. Several um, month. Yes. 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 Wow. A very exhaustive look at really every single highlight he's had from Japan to Puerto Rico, to Germany, to the WWF, to the NWA against Ric Flair, to Florida against Dusty Rhodes, to Memphis against Jerry the King Lawler. Jeez. Of course, the Mick Foley death matches and IWA and FMW, his run in WCW in 2000 towards the tail end of the Attitude Era, and just the menagerie of different independents that he closed out his career working in to say nothing of defining the spirit of that 90s uh, rebel wrestling group, Extreme Championship Wrestling. So I just ask you this off the top, JP, before we get into some of this sound what do people need to know about Terry Funk if their if their view on what he was and and what he accomplished is is limited to just a few years here or a few years there in totality what is there to say about the man Terry Funk is hands down the greatest wrestler of all time he is a wrestler that i mean i'll come out and say right away the extreme stuff the violent stuff this FMW stuff. For me, it's FMW is fucking miserable wrestling is what that is. All right. Well, just, why didn't you hit me with that, Jim, during the course of our series? You saved that one for dark side. Disagree. But go on. I, I, it's just not, I can't do it. I just can't, you know, the, the, just, despite all that, there is nobody, not a single person in the wrestling business who has redefined themselves reestablished themselves 
and recreated themselves as many times and for as long. When you really think about Terry Funk and the fact he that he debuted in 1965 and had his last match in 2017, is that what you're talking about? That's exactly what I'm talking about. And the fact that he goes from, from the 60s, like, you know, peak Bruno era, to the 70s, to the rock and wrestling era, to, you know, yeah, I forgot the to mention era. Uh, wrestling Hulk Hogan on NBC in yeah. my litany of things. And what's amazing is that. He may have had to, to hide and kind of, you know, work around some limitations for whatever the fuck it was for himself, but, but like he made it work and he looked like, he looked like he was, you know, a man not on the verge of breaking apart. He, you he, know? he was a magician. He was, he was an absolute magician. I mean, when you consider what happened to his knees, you mentioned Beyond the Mad Evan. I mean, in that movie, which was filmed in 96, they tell him you shouldn't be able to walk. And then he wrestles for another 20 years. And when he's in the ring, I mean, sure, he has a strange gait, but you can't necessarily tell the guy's, you know, has no business walking. It's just, there's so much to say about Terry Funk. I think you put it very well there, JP. I mean, the scope is unbelievable. And if you have, you know, whatever you love about Terry Funk, you have to realize that that is 8% of his career and contributions to the business. This is to say nothing of the guys who have said in interviews and in published books and things that he was the one that kept them in the business when they were doubting their ability to thrive in it. From Ric Flair to Hulk Hogan to Harley Race to Itchushi Onida, as mentioned, to Abdullah the Butcher, Tito Santana, Greg Valentine, the list goes on and on and on of prominent wrestlers. Eddie Guerrero has a great story about how Terry Funk encouraged him uh, to stay in the business. So many so many modern wrestlers like Eddie Kingston and John Moxley point to him. Dennis Stamp, even. <laughs> hey, there we go. He wasn't booked, so that was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So let's let's waste no time because this interview that you were able to conduct with the Funker, which, as you mentioned, it, 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 you know, I kind of exaggerate. It wasn't death store. He died in, in 2023, but a lot of the, the symptoms that kind of took him out of the public eye uh, had become apparent and and it was tough to look upon the man and hear about the man sort of post 2020 without, you know, feeling like perhaps the end might be near. His wife passed away before he did, and he was with her for decades going back to high school. So, uh, you know, that was that was a very difficult and trying time and probably accelerated uh, his exit from the earth as well. One, one, one would have to think. But when it comes to what he told you guys, um, it, it's a story that's lost to time. It's a time in wrestling where you basically, we know this Fritz von Erich did the same thing. You, you buy a trailer and you drive to different parts of the country, North America, Canada included, and you find a trailer park and you set your family up in there. And the trailer park tends to have a whole bunch of other wrestlers and their families uh, putting down roots. And there's like this little community of wrestlers and the wives of the wrestlers and the children of the wrestlers. It, it's kind of depicted in Randy Ram and the uh, Randy the Ram in the wrestler movie with Mickey Rourke, kind of. The way he lives in that trailer is very reminiscent of this time, except in Terry Funk's day, when his father, Dory Funk Sr., was a top name in the business in the 50s, it, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't something that was sort of, you know, gross or something that was depressing. It was just this, this sort of nomadic lifestyle that these guys led. And here in this clip, uh, he talks about, uh, you know, his father's background. He sets the stage, how his father... In the 20s, uh, 30s, and 40s, came up wrestling amateur, started professional wrestling after he served in the Navy in World War II. They went out uh, by Chicago. Of course, Funk was born in Hammond, Indiana, um, and there was a wrestling show there one night, and Dory Sr. challenged one of the wrestlers in the ring, according to Terry Funk, and beat the guy, and they kept on looking for people to beat this guy, and he was able to beat them in, you know, legitimate amateur wrestling exhibitions, and so they decided that he deserved to be in the business to break him in, and and that happened. So here, Terry sitting in his living room, I take it, in Amarillo, Texas, uh, the city he defined in so many ways, describes a most unique childhood in the wrestling business. How did you spend your time as a kid when you're out, when you're, when you're uh, on the road with your dad? Well, we would, we would uh, that was very different because it was a different era in wrestling. And uh, what we would do is uh, we had a trailer we pulled behind our car. And uh, that trailer we lived in. And we'd go to a trailer court, and there would be areas all over the country. And the wrestlers would, if you were, say, maybe wrestling in the Oklahoma Territory, 
pull into Tulsa and park your trailer and use your car to get to all of the towns. And that's the way it worked. And if you were wrestling in Chicago, you would do the same thing up there. In Amarillo, Texas, it was the same way down here. Sounds, Evan, like just looking at the walls, you could tell there was that, that depth of history to Terry Funk's story in wrestling. Absolutely. And that's somewhat also depicted in the Iron Claw a little bit, too. We mean, You mentioned uh, Fritz von Erich, but you see that in the beginning of the film in the black and white section uh, of, you know, the family on the road sort of with it, with, you know, traveling with their dad as the wrestler and kind of living that lifestyle from town to town. And man, that's just w- what a way to grow up, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to see the to to not only see that world, but also you have to imagine that those old school guys are probably kayfabe in the family or to what extent, who knows? It's just what a wild existence. These guys are driving town to town and it's pre a lot of the stars of the fifties, like your Vern Gagne's, your Fritz von Erich's, your Dory Funk seniors buying in to territories, Eddie Graham. So you didn't even have like these top stars who owned the wrestling office and thus had a home in the city that they worked in the most and drove uh, to the towns in that circuit from there. It was before that. It was when basically, you know, wrestling on the Dumont Network out of Chicago and promoter Fred Kohler was was the ticket to national exposure in the United States on on television. That's how Gorgeous George became a phenomenon. Lou Thez was the champion du jour. Then um, Vern Gagne became U.S. champion on that network, and that built up his stardom such that he could set up a real wrestling empire, the AWA out of Minnesota. But this is just slightly before that where you really brought your home to the territory, and you certainly didn't fly, Um that, that's like post Vince McMahon Jr.'s takeover where wrestlers fly to every single city. This was, this was just such a, such a, a point in time. And you mentioned Fritz von Erich. I mean, I, I, we, we reached this conclusion, JP, didn't we, when we looked at Terry Funk's career? I mean, what Fritz was looking for from his children in terms of going on to be world champion, uh, that's what Dory Sr. pulled off because both his sons, Dory Jr. and Terry Funk, became NWA world champion, became power brokers in the business, became movers and shakers. And you can't help but look at Fritz as trying to copy what the Funks were able to do, fellow Texans. Yeah, I mean, I imagine that uh, that a lot of what what was going on in Fritz's mind was, you know, if they can do it, why can't I do it? Why is it not working for me? They they did it, bunch of bunch of loons so, yeah, right. <laughs> down in Amarillo. And of course, go ahead, David. Yeah. I was just gonna say it's it's just you know it's also such a carny life. It's like you're literally in a traveling circus, you know, and setting up your trailer outside the you know, like, like the big top, that's, that's what it's like. Absolutely. It's just such a different era that it's hard to even fathom that it's not like in the 1890s. You know? Right. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's not, it's like, not even that long ago. It's not, you know, especially in the, in terms of the evolution of the wrestling business, it's, it's, it's quite recent, but it's, right. um, it's unbelievable. And, you know, we mentioned, you know, kayfabing the kids and how to train them to go on to be champions. Uh, Terry Funk certainly did talk to you guys about how he was trained. And of course, from these fundamentals, Terry would graduate, if you could put it that way, into barbed wire and mayhem later in his career, things that just seemed way extreme and way too dangerous for the, the sort of fundamental training that he talks about. But here in this clip, he talks about how he actually wasn't as afraid of barbed wire as you might think, due to a, let's say, unique experience in his childhood. You know, as uh, whenever I was a young kid, you know, as I used to I don't know about barbed wire, but I know about electric fence, you know, because I peed on an electric fence one time. I know how that felt, and it felt pretty bad. (laughs) Barbed wire felt bad, too, but, you know, I always had that one thing I could remember that was was worse. (laughs) I thought that was pretty funny. (laughs) But it's true. Is it? Yeah, that happened. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I remember that. How old were you when that happened? About six, seven. <laughs> Got out to go pee and pee on the bobble on the electric fence. It's funny as we're doing this and we're listening to these clips and it's I, I, I now I can remember like we're just listening to audio here, but I can remember exactly his facial expression in that, in that telling that story and going back to that very moment. And it was, it's uh, oh, so funny. And that kind of was that that's a good kind of snippet of what the entire interview was sort of like, <laughs> you know, where it was like asking him about one thing and then we'd kind of get into some, right. You know, very funny and amusing sidebar, you know, like, like pissing on a, a pissing on electric fence. 
I went ahead and, and peed on an electric fence, and that's how my hair turned out the way that it did. <laughs> so, things like that. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And he does. He does a lot of going ahead, Evan. Yes. <laughs> Yes, exactly. He can take he can take us anywhere he wants. And it was funny too. It's like I I remember asking him about the you know the barbed wire because we're obviously looking for you know the stakes of that. What, what does it feel like to have your flesh ripped apart like that, and to do and the psychology of going into these matches and so on and so forth. And I do remember him talking about the Atsushi Onita you know exploding ring match. And like how it's not like this is a stunt, you know, stunt work in a, in a movie. No one's no one's showing you where the spots are and what they're going to what people are going to be doing in these matches. You just kind of get in there and you wing it. And it's crazy to get into something, a situation like that and to not have a, a thorough plan or idea in mind of, you know, where the explosions are going to be, when and why and where. And it's because that's what he said. And it's just it's amazing. So more on on training the next generation there, one of those sidebars in funk style, but hear more about uh, training wrestlers to become anywhere near the level he was able to achieve. You've got to pay a price. What is your price? Sometimes it's getting your butt kicked a lot. Sometimes sometimes you have to look for your for your for your niche. You really do. And uh, whenever you get a niche in wrestling is you better take it because it might be the only one you get. You know, and uh, you've got to earn it. And, and back then, is you had to be a tough guy. You couldn't be a wussy. It was not good to be a wussy. And wussies did not make the big money. You look at the guys back then and you see the Hodges, the Ganyas, the Geigles, the funks, all of them with those amateur backgrounds. And uh, we evolved. What did we evolve for us? By time, and I'm not knocking anybody, but we evolved to a different group of wrestlers and a different style of wrestling. Why did it evolve that way? Really is, it's what the fans want. It's what they desire and it's what they demand. And we are what the public wants. And whether you know it or whether I know it or not, McMahon is giving them what they want, what Terry wants wrestling to be is different from what it is. We spent a lot of time, JP, listening to tape of Terry Funk talk about his career over the years, and there's a motif there where he just can't help but eventually mention Vince McMahon and the changes that Vince ushered into the the style of wrestling, what they emphasize in wrestling, the whole presentation of the thing. And, you know, Funk participated in 85 over there in 86, and he, he came to appreciate what Vince did, but he also kind of mourned the loss of something. He keeps referencing a day before Vince, and he's cognizant that he does that, um, it's clear in the interview that he, he sort of like catches himself constantly going back to Vince, but uh, he also didn't hold back at all in, in his viewpoints of, nope. of Vince McMahon. It seemed like a duality here, uh, JP, with the, with, with the Funker. I mean, I, 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 imagine, I imagine that there is a, a, uh, uh, that there is a conflict in someone like Terry Funk because I think he's torn between respecting the business that he grew up in and that he started in, which is a much more intense, athletic, uh, really emphasizing the kayfabe aspect of it without being, you know, like as flashy and flamboyant as the rock and wrestling era. But at the same time, he can't deny how thick his wallet was during that, that, like that Mm. run. You know, Mm -hmm. I think that that's really probably where the where where the tough part is for him because I imagine seeing wrestling become more mainstream and a much more accepted form of entertainment was great because more people wanted to watch it, more people taken, you know, more people given uh, 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 wrestling companies money. But you know what he grew up in the the business that he loved and respected it can't really live in that 
per se. It's almost, Evan, like he's acknowledging that, you know, to survive in the industry that he loves, you have to relinquish your sense of how it should be done at a certain point and evolve with what the fans tell you to do. And thus, right, Evan, we end up with Terry Funk and exploding rings. Yes, exactly. I was just about to say that. That's a that's a very key line there from uh, what he was saying in terms of it, it may not be what I want it to be. And it's what the fans want. And almost like you're, you know, you are beholden to that. And it's interesting. Anytime we've examined on the show, uh, like extreme wrestling, ECW, hardcore wrestling, that's such a common theme. It's like the bar is escalating. Something changed in wrestling where everything started to ramp up with violence and, and, and the need to outdo one another and the, you know, the bloodthirsty, you know, audiences can't be quenched, you know, unless we go one step farther. And, uh, it's interesting because that's something that, you know, he responds to. Obviously, McFoley does as well. And uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting to hear him talk about that. And yeah, it, like it, and to think that all that stuff that he did, all the stuff that he put his body through, for Christ's sake, the, the goddamn uh, Sabu barbed wire ring rope match, yep. which traumatized me as a child, <laughs> you know, seeing that on tape. And, uh, and, and, and knowing that, I mean, obviously he does, he must have some, you know, uh, interest <laughs> in that style. But, uh, I definitely know that he's feeding off the energy and the wants and desires and, uh, of the crowd as well too. And yeah, that's just key, key when talking about Terry and the trajectory of this kind of wrestling. And of course you're sitting with him to talk about it. Shushi Onida and that style of match. You're going to ask him about the barbed wire matches and you're going to ask him about how he felt about participating in him. And while there is a bit of macabre in him, you know, for sure, uh, He's not necessarily relishing these matches where he's putting himself at extreme risk with all these these stunts and these props that can hurt you for real, you know, explosions that could actually burn you if you miscalculate, a barbed wire that can actually slice you because uh, it, it was quite a while later that they started using rubber barbed wire in pro wrestling. This was not thought to be uh, something that you could fake very effectively, so you go, went out there and took the risk. Um, but he says, you know what, basically, at the time, the 90s, uh, that's how enough money could be made by somebody like a Terry Funk right. that he could really thrive and live comfortably as a pro wrestler. And this is key without having to march to Vince McMahon's drum. You've got to be just nuttier than a fruitcake to get into one of those matches in the first place. You know, and, uh, did I enjoy it? I enjoyed the, the money from it. I enjoyed the notoriety from it. I enjoyed uh, the life it's given me. And it's given me the ability to live the way I want now and not have to be kissing Vince's ass. There wow. it is. As you can see, I'm a very... Thoughtful of Vince. <laughs> <laughs> there it is again. <laughs> no, I really do. As you know, as uh, yeah, I, honestly and seriously, as I damn sure hate and I damn sure despise being beat at something. And he won the goddamn war. Mm. And I don't like it, and I'll never like it. And I'm pissed about it. That came through so strong. Wow. In this wow. interview. And he's talking there, Evan, about, yeah, I mean, I didn't necessarily relish those matches, but I'm sitting here in this rather uh, comfortable scenario. You saw the house. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he it's, that's not Vince's money that bought that house. That's Terry Funk trying to follow where the business is going outside of Vince McMahon and maximizing the paydays. And sometimes you got to blow yourself up for it. What a rebel, man. What, what an outlaw, you know, amazing. Um, obviously everything we know now about Vince, but it's so much the common theme, our experience on the road, keep being out there, interviewing all these guys is uh, very still beholden, very still um, f scared of Vince and, trying to always maybe still I could get in the good graces. And you can really understand that hold of control and fear that this person has, 
you know, on all these people in this entire industry, except for a very few at this time, you know, and what year is this? 2020? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, to hear, to hear him, you know, someone like him, you know, say something like that is extraordinarily powerful and badass. And his thoughts keep drifting to, to Vince JP. I mean, he was asked a question, you know, about whether the barbed wire matches were worth it. And the way he interprets that is I didn't have to work for Vince. And Funk came from a time where he believed in a business that Vince McMahon did not follow the playbook of. And all of the, 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 the dark arts that Terry Funk mastered to make sure that when he came to a town, he left it better than he arrived in it, be it as defending NWA world champion, being as this maniacal uh, heel promo where he would, you know, say just the most outlandish things about a Dusty Rhodes in Florida or a Jerry Lawler in Memphis and kept him coming back for more. Um, that, that art was sort of now um, given over to Vince McMahon, who sort of, who sort of stood atop the pyramid and, and made decisions about how everybody was going to come off. When he came into WWF, his whole family was portrayed as, you know, kind of just like dumb cowboys a little bit, or just like <laughs> wacky Bronco riding. It was a New York vision of what an Amarillo cowboy was. It, it wasn't yeah. an Amarillo version of what New York is, right? And, no, not at all. And, and just, I don't know, I don't know what, what you think, but it's just so intriguing to me that no matter what he's asked about, right, the, the measure of whether it was worth it, comes back to how dependent he had to be on, on Vince McMahon's good graces or not. There's the battle right there, you know, like that, that's kind of his, his lifelong battle having to, 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 to kiss the ring or, or do it on his own, do it his own way. And, uh, uh, you know, they did it. <laughs> he did it his way. He did it his way as we, cause he likes it that way. We made a lot of hay of that on our, on our journey through his career. Cause he said that in a famous ECW promo and it, it, it sums it all up. Now, one thing that you guys got from Terry that I was fascinated by Evan was, you know, you guys, whenever you can like to show on an iPad or whatever footage to your interview subjects to, to get them to react to things that are seminal moments. And you offer to show Terry Funk for the purposes, of course, of the Shushi Onida FMW episode footage of him wrestling Onida in the exploding ring barbed wire match in 1993. And listen to his reaction uh, when you guys, uh, you know, pr- propose that he that he watched this. Do you remember the crowd that night? Was the crowd into it? Oh, definitely they were, and that was, you know, as I hate to say it, but I am a, I am a glutton for a crowd being into a match, you know. And I am thrilled to death whenever I would rather capture a crowd than to capture the money. And that's stupid. Nobody can be stupider than that, you know. You want to capture the money first. Get to pay beforehand, no. Didn't matter to me, you know. <laughs> I was just out there ready to capture that crowd. And that's, and we did. Have you seen the footage of that match before? Probably not. Really? I don't recall it, no. Oh, wow. Maybe we can show it to him. <laughs> no, I don't want to watch it. Oh, you don't want to watch it? No, no. No, no, no. Wow. Is there a reason? I just, to... yeah, I want to remember it. Okay. Can you explain why? Yeah, well, hell yes. I thought I kicked the shit out of him. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to not know that. <laughs> <laughs> what about that moment, Evan? Amazing. Amazing. God, I forgot about that. Yeah, that, that was something that we was sort of get in the habit of, of showing uh, archive uh, or showing matches to some of our interview subjects, especially the ones that have just epically long careers. Like another one that comes to mind is Abdul the Butcher, where he, it was impossible to break through <laughs> in terms of the interview, like to get real, you know, unworked answers yes. about anything um, until we actually started showing him footage of uh, Bruiser Brody matches. This was back when we did the pilot. And just to see his face light up and um, it unlocked this like uh, waterfall of memories and nostalgia and emotions. And finally, then, you know, we got to talk to the real person. <laughs> you know, I've told the butcher after that. But that was sort of uh, was something we always like to do. But this is a great uh, you know, reason not to is to savor the memory, you know, savor that being in the being in the moment of, you know, what it is uh, or what it was. And that moment and hearing the crowd and and also just to talk about what he's saying about capturing the crowd, you know, before you capture the money or capture the money before you capture the crowd. And 
man, there's a whole subculture <laughs> of wrestling that don't, don't do that, <laughs> you know, right. This day and age. Uh, yeah. So fascinating. A lot of the guys who practice the, the style that these matches between Funk and Onita and so many others and Mick Foley, Cactus Jack, you know, this exploding crazy uh, ultra violent kind of matches. A lot of those guys don't do it for much money at all. You would think it would be the biggest payday in the industry to put yourself through that. But it's whole, like you said, a whole subculture emerged of, of guys who, who saw that as their way into the business and they sort of fell passionately in love with that version of, of wrestling. And, and we saw it in, in, in so many different ways. I mean, you guys, you know, of course, uh, have touched on it from several different angles. You've looked at some legends of, of this world, um, in the past and, uh, and yeah, it can be, it can be hard for the general average public to understand why someone ends up in, in the position that some of these guys did. Yeah. And just real quick, one, one, uh, obviously one person we talk to all the time who has a lot on this subject is obviously Mick Foley. Um, and really getting into the psychology of Mick Foley is very fascinating because I truly believe with him. Um, I do look at Mick Foley as somebody who that is, um, a performance artist, like yeah. someone who literally is uh, a theater of pain, you know, type yes. of individual, somebody who, um, you know, does that for performance and, and that is their art, you know, and I think he looks at it that way too. He looks at what he does as his art. Now there is some, you know, repercussions from that, not only just himself physically, but also who it inspires. And, uh, there's a lot of people who wound up emulating that and wound up like, you know, putting yourself in harm's way and raising the bar to where you can't go beyond that limit without, you know, I don't know, pulling out a gun and shooting somebody in the yeah, middle sure. of the ring. Well, I think of the Nick Gage and, stuff, you know, right. Or the, yes, oh, of course. Oh my God. Yes. You know, and bleeding um, out on a field in Delaware somewhere, you know, Jesus you, Christ. Yeah. It, it all flows downstream from the stuff Terry Funk's talking about here. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Not to be morbid about it. It's, it's definitely um, something XPW, you guys did that episode. You talked about mm -hmm. Vic Grimes tangling with new Jack. It's like a whole, you know, funk is doing it. He's making it very clear why he's doing it. it it's his way to stand out and make real great paydays without having to, you know, uh, cast his, his line in, into, um, you know, controlling uh, national organizations. He was always somebody who wanted to be able to come and go from territory to territory and sort of preserve uh, the, the, the the uniqueness of him being somewhere for any period of time. He wanted that to mean something. And he also is very uh, aware, again, we talked about this with the New Jack episode that we did, is he's also very aware, again, about legacy and creating these moments, I think, that we're always going to be talking about. You know, even though there might have only been 1,200 people, if that even, <laughs> at the Sabu you know, what is it? Born to be wired match. Yeah. In August, 1997. Uh, we're not yeah, one of JP's favorites, JP's favorite match. <laughs> we're not going to ever forget that, you know, um, for better or worse. And, you know, he makes these indelible, you know, visceral moments as well as amazing, you know, technical wrestling moments as well too. That's like, it. you know, yeah. and back in, you know, back in those days, it's, it's incredible. It's the same guy <laughs> as we've said. I, I don't necessarily agree with his, with his, uh, uh, you know, method of becoming this, this hardcore, you know, brutal wrestler. But I, again, I, I respect the fact that he had the wherewithal to recognize that this is where he needed to go to stay relevant. But it is, you know, when you, again, that, that to me is always the, the magical thing that what I've learned since we've been doing our, our, our project on, on Terry Funk is is just that is that is that you know you think about when you think about all these different people that he was able to wrestle and none of them even crossed paths <laughs> you know how many uh uh you know you think about how many people can say they uh you know they they wrestled abdul the butcher and cm punk how about lou Thez and cm punk there we go lou Thez and cm punk even better you know what it's like it's like an outlaw country star you know, from the 60s, put out a harsh noise album, you know, in 1999, <laughs> you know, or, or like, or like put out like, you know, some grind core. Yeah. Jo know, Johnny uh, Pay Paycheck does Pantera. Exactly. Johnny Paycheck does Mers Bow, you know. Yes. Um, and, and it's, <laughs> uh, it's amazing. That's amazing. JP, what did you hear in Terry Funk's hesitation to wanting to watch footage of the match? We remember from our coverage of him that he 
He never wanted to see himself do a moonsault. That's when he started going nuts in 93, when he started moonsaulting at his age. Oh, like, fuck yeah. A backflip off the top was just not something he had to do, especially before small crowds. Apparently it was. <laughs> Apparently, what the, the, the I'll tell you what, I, I heard also, too, that the smaller the crowd, the more moonsaults he would do. <laughs> but, there, <laughs> but there he's saying, like, no, I want to, rem- I, I, I remember we, I think when he says we kicked the shit out of it, I think what he means is it was a great match. It was a home oh, run. Yeah. I don't want to watch the match and realize that it wasn't as great as I remember that. It was very, that's a fascinating hang up that Terry Funk had. Love it. It's funny, you know, uh, to bring it onto a whole different level. I actually, something similar happened to me not too long ago where I had found old videotapes of all of my, like the, the videos of, of the shows that I did in theater when I was in high school. And I texted my drama teacher from back then. I said, Hey, you know, I've got all these. Do you want them? And he said, no, I don't want to watch them. I want to remember them. Wow. And I was like, holy shit, like that makes sense. I mean, you know, our memory of anything that we did that was awesome is never going to match what actually happened or what we, or, or, or if it stands the test of time. Like we watch something back. It's like, oh, oh, that sucked. That wasn't very good, but it felt good at the time. And preserve that. Preserve that as long as you can. And Terry Funk had so many different eras and so many different decades and so many different parts of the world that he worked in that I'm sure a lot of his fondest memories weren't on tape. You know, there wasn't a camera there or it was it was still film as opposed to VHS and it wasn't easy to get your hands on. And you know, we talked about how there's precious few video evidence pieces of Terry Funk actually defending as reigning NWA World Heavyweight Champion. There's, of course, him winning it on tape, him losing it on tape. But as far as that year where he traveled the country like a madman defending against the biggest stars in the world, nothing. And so I'm sure he remembers that with a certain glow. And just because everything is on tape at the tail end of his career doesn't mean he changes necessarily his orientation to how he wants to to look at it. It's all part of his sort of philosophy of how can I be the most relevant, resonant and real and really legendary wrestler to fans without uh, marrying to the big two. For the most part, his most seminal contributions to become the best or the greatest, as many say, happened outside of those uh, auspices. And I think uh, in Shushi Onita, he saw somebody that did just the same in the Japanese wrestling scene. He did just the same without having to be wedded to Antonio Inoki's New Japan Pro Wrestling or Giant Baba's All Japan Pro Wrestling, a thing that could fill baseball stadiums because it came with a unique proposition, as violent and wacky as it may have been. And uh, Terry talked to you guys about that. He talked about how uh, in at Shushi Onita, um, he saw the same guy trying to stay alive as the two superpowers constantly look to dominate and, and gobble up everything around them. Baba and Enoki both, you know, Baba hated Enoki. Enoki hated Baba. But both of them hated Sushi Onida. <laughs> and uh, at Sushi Onida was honestly and seriously, if it wasn't for me, he wouldn't be. So he was my creation. Is what he was, and uh, I was always proud of him for the 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 places that he made over there. Now you got to figure that this kid came up from asking me, wanting to be anything in the business. From he didn't care if it was referee, he didn't care what it was. He wanted to be in wrestling, and that's what he came for the United States to do. God only knows how he made the money to get here. I don't know how he got here, but the kid got here. And uh, he made it all the way to, through politics, through everything. And uh, he had a monumental life. And you can still ask anybody in, in Japan, who is it, Sushi Onita? And they all know. I mean, he did it he, for himself from, from a kid that grew up from being a common, ordinary nobody in Japan. Can you imagine that on a place the size of California with 110 million people in it or 120 million and going ahead and coming all the way through that? all the way into becoming 
a political leader? How do you do it? He did it. Was he smart? I don't think so. I think <laughs> it, I think he managed it all because he is completely nuts. You know? And I'm nuts like that too. Terry Funk passed away August 23rd, 2023 at the age of 79. A legend in every sense of the word, Evan. Oh my God. Yeah. That's just, it's just hard to even encapsulate because... Yeah, he's so influential. You know, again, you, JP, you said it too, the greatest wrestler yeah. that ever lived. Yeah. And I can't argue with that. And if you want to argue with that, go see Ric Flair tweeting upon Terry's death that Terry's the greatest. Right. You know, I mean, it's that's the problem is if you want to argue the point, the people you want to say were the greatest probably thought Terry was the greatest too. I, I thought you were going to say, and if you don't, we'll go fuck yourself. <laughs> you know? I left that up. <laughs> well, that's, what I, that's what I was going to say, right. but you know, that's all right. <laughs> yeah. Um, And, uh, yeah, I, I just, again, to respond to that clip too, I, I just remember him, you know, talking about how, you know, Onita modeled himself after Terry. He, he sought out Terry in order to, like so many did, uh, like so many did, you know, in order to start his journey. And it's so funny where I, you kind of sense that leeriness, like, uh, oh, my craziness inspired somebody else. And that's not exactly what I had in mind, <laughs> you know, is this sort of butterfly effect of what my work is and how it's going to inspire somebody else to do, you know, maybe for different reasons or for crazier, who knows, maybe for, yeah, whatever, you know, and I, and I always think about, you know, Mick Foley's the same way. He sort of idolized himself in part by Terry Funk as well. And, and, and then as soon as that, that, that cycle continues, it's like, then you have a Nick Gage, you know, who's inspired by a, a Mick Foley. And then I, I remember Mick telling me like when he first met Nick, it's like Nick came up to him and was like, Oh man, you're the shit. You're my, you're my God. You're the God of this shit, you know, and you inspired me to do all this stuff. And then Mick's only reaction was, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, that's really funny. It's like you have all this guilt, you know, from all that. But um, anyway, it just goes to say, uh, you know, Terry, it's a legend. I'm grateful for the opportunity that we had to interview him uh, for this. Uh, and I have to shout out also uh, uh, this guy, Jared Cheek. Uh, he uh, put out a audio vinyl. I think it was an interview of, of Terry uh, that he put out on vinyl. Super cool. And Jared was always in contact with Terry uh, in the last years of his life. And that's how we got through to Terry and, and scheduled the interview. And so he was a huge part of that. And I should also mention that we did also film another segment with Terry after this. It was for season four when we were doing the Abdul the Butcher episode. He was in the care facility and we actually flew Mick Foley down to Amarillo and he spent like, he, you know, he, he, it's, it's basically them eating ribs and barbecue talking about Abdullah the butcher. And it was tough to make it work in the episode. Um, cause he wasn't necessarily comfortable with like a traditional sit down interview, but with Mick being there and we shot this thing. And then when Terry unfortunately passed, we released a little snippet uh, of that on social media. Um, so you can see that on the dark side, Instagram, there's a, an awesome video of, of Terry and Mick just from probably if not last late 2022 or early 2023. Yeah. Check that out so much that uh dark side was able to capture of the legendary Funker in his, his last days. So again, it's an all new dark side of the ring um, about the wild life of the legendary Harley race in so many ways, a contemporary and a brother in arms to our subject du jour this week on Unheard, Terry Funk. That's Tuesday at 10 p.m. on Vice TV, a look at the incredible life of Harley Race. For now and for us, it's back to the vault. So we're going to see you next time on Dark Side of the Ring, Unheard. Hey everybody, it's Jack from The Lapsed Fan. Thanks for checking out the latest Unheard episode focused on the late, great Terry Funk. We did want to let you know that The Lapsed Fan will be live in Philadelphia on WrestleMania weekend for a live podcast and comedy show Sunday, April 7th at noon at Punchline Philly in the city of brotherly love. That's between nights one and two of Mania. In addition to JP and myself laying down the truth, as you know The Lapsed Fan can, 
We'll be joined by great comedians like Lemare Lee, Scott Chaplin, Ray Goots, David Piantowski, and Ryan Shaner, all wrestling fans with biting takes on this endlessly fascinating industry. And speaking of Terry Funk, if you buy tickets to the show ahead of time and send your proof of purchase to the lapsed fan at gmail.com, the lapsed fan at gmail.com, you'll be entered into a raffle to win an authentic Terry Funk branding iron. We obtained this one of a kind piece from the Funkers estate sale after his passing as part of our lapsed funk series. And in the city where the branding iron burned brightest and caused the most havoc, Philly, we're going to give it away. Each ticket purchase entitles you to an entry in the raffle and will award the branding iron on stage that afternoon. Again, you must send us proof of your ticket purchase to thelapsedfan at gmail.com to be entered into the raffle. So head to punchlinephilly.com, P-U-N-C-H-L-I-N-E, philly.com, and buy your tickets now. It's the Lapsed Fan Live. We're calling it our Bozos, Biceps, and Bullshit Brunch, and we'd love to see you there.